Hello, I'm Ileana Pena. I'm a professor of medicine at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. And this is my usual blog, except I am here from the absolutely beautiful city of Amsterdam, where the ESC 2023 has been going on. There's incredible amounts of energy. There are a lot of new trials um, being presented and new learnings. Uh, and so I'm going to review very briefly the 2023 European update to the guidelines. So Teresa McDonough has been the first author of the um, previous ESC or European guidelines. A little bit different than the American guidelines, which were presented in 2022. So just a year ago, right around the time of the American College of Cardiology. And we knew that we needed an update. Uh, the Europeans have gotten ahead of us, and now we have the European update, which I find incredibly well written uh, and really highlighting the areas that I think the takeaways are for the clinicians. First of all, we have been seeing now for several years, actually since 2018, the benefits of the SGLT2 inhibitors. And every time we lift the veil on something, there they are in a positive light. We have learned about reduced ejection fraction, in other words, HEFREF, for both empagliflozin and dapagliflozin, very, very similar results. Yeah, one, one population may be enriched with a little of this and a little of that, but the basic messages are the same. Both of these drugs in HEFREF uh, improve outcomes, and it happens quickly. You don't have to wait a year or two years to see this within months. Actually, within days, you start to see the curve split apart statistically. And so the next logical ground was preserved, HEFPEF, which the definition when we started the HEFPEF trials was 45 or greater. I want the audience to realize that in the midst of all these trials, we came out, we meaning American Heart, American College, and the Heart Failure Society, with a new definition of heart failure. And that new definition of heart failure said that true HEFPEF is 50 or greater. And that, that in-between zone of 40 to 50 or 41 to 49 is MREF or middle of the road. And I think the Europeans have really emphasized that to us. I believe that those patients really behave much more like a HEFPREF population. So now that we have very positive findings with the SGLT2s, both dapagliflozin and empagliflozin with HEFPEF defined, as I said, 40 or 45 or greater, not necessarily 50, but with excellent point estimates that just line up one on top of the other. Doesn't matter if they're diabetic or no diabetes, the results are exactly the same. So this has been so promising that I am actually not surprised that the Europeans elevated the SGLT2s to a 1A indication. In the US in 2022, we thought we were re really way ahead by calling it a 2A indication. Well, now it's a 1A indication, and I have a feeling that the American Heart Association and the American College are gonna start talking about an update because the data are so strong. And now we even have data on initiating these drugs in the hospital. And Impulse was a very large trial presented here about the benefits of starting these drugs in the hospital. So you do not have to wait until the patient is in the outpatient. You can start it in the hospital. When? I have no specific day that I started. I usually try to do a good diuresis first, get the patient somewhat decongested, and then stop it. But I don't want to deprive the patients of the benefits of these drugs that happen very, very early by waiting until the patients are in the outpatient. In the United States, we have had some issues with coverage of some of these drugs. In my institution, we now have both on the formulary, and I pick the drug depending upon the patient's coverage. Medicare pretty much covers most of them, but if the patient is older but not yet a Medicare population, they may have a very large copay. So I really advise you to get your offices or your health system to look into this so that when you give the prescription to the patient, when they're, whether they're leaving the hospital or now in your clinics, that they can actually get the drug. 
There is one additional recommendation in these guidelines for finerenone, that MRA that I've discussed before on this blog, that has some really promising data on type 2 diabetes with CKD. And they have called that a 1A indication for finerenone. So I think more to come. And one more, the iron deficiency, that giving IV iron actually does improve symptoms and quality of life. And I have seen this in my own patients. So I have been very diligent at looking for iron deficiency. So it is a new era. We have more tools, obviously, for our patients. It means one more drug. And that's always a challenge. To, we've already been doing the pillars of care. This is the fourth pillar of care, but now with a 1A indication. So take a look. They're easy to read. Uh, the Professor McDonough is the first author, um, but I think they've been extremely well done. I hope this helps. And I am looking forward to future blogs on perhaps some of the findings in this uh, meeting that we're having. Ileana Pina signing off. Have a great day. Thank <laughs> you.